Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Mass Trade Connect. Uh, Martin Redman here with the latest tech talk. Uh, we're talking about cybersecurity, something that's going to affect um, every yacht under the ISM code uh, from Jan 1, 2021. I'm joined by two very esteemed gentlemen, Mike Blake from Palladium uh, and Dr. Paul Hunton from Maritime Cyber Solutions. Uh, good afternoon, guys. How are you? Great, Martin. Yes, very well, thank you. Yeah, good, good. Nice to be here. Yeah, well, listen, I think, I think the most important thing to sort of reinforce or to, to explore, first of all, is, is what is looming on the 1st of January? Uh, what, is, what is the current sort of uh, expectation and plan on the 1st of January, Paul? Um, yeah, as of the 1st of January, it becomes um, mandated in the ISM requirements that you will introduce cyber risk management. And I use that term, I stress that term, cyber risk management. Uh, into your safety management systems on board. Um, the key here, which um, I guess we've all heard the 1st of January, what it says is it's to do with your document of compliance when your assessment comes along. So if you're assessed on the 1st of January, then it's relevant to you on the 1st of January. If you're assessed on the 31st of December, you've got a rolling 12 months. But within those 12 months, you are expected to implement cyber risk management as part of the ISM code requirements. Okay, so in a nutshell, what does that really mean? Well, there are a whole host of uh, guidance documents that have been implemented in the ISM code since 2018, which spell out what you should be doing um, very generally, uh, that you should conduct a cyber risk assessment. From the cyber risk assessment, you will establish some sort of gap analysis. A gap analysis is where you would like to be and where you currently are. And then you look at producing a cyber risk management plan that will then allow you to develop and move forward to make a better, safer environment uh, on board. Yeah. So Mike, uh, during the pandemic, everyone's become very virtual now, like this session now. Um, what are the real risks that you think we are facing in the yacht market that cyber is a critical part of the, uh, I say, mitigation? Well, there are a number of aspects. So since, since we're all virtual, as we can see right now, the issue is we're all spreading this data much more widely than we were when we were in our offices, whether we're brokers or whether we're fleet management or whether we're actually employees working for a yacht, but we're, we're working from home at this time, like a lot of the captains on rotation are. So this brings in another host of issues. Now all of a sudden our, shall we call it our shields that we uh, need to have up for the data protection get extended much farther than just beyond the yacht itself. Yeah. And, and, and I, th I think, you know, there are a number of parallels that should be drawn here. A year ago, quite honestly, none of us would have been worried about a pandemic and what impacts the pandemic would have had on us. So we were all pretty naive in that aspect. Today, we are working from home. Yeah. It brings another host of issues, as you mentioned. But I, I can relate maybe more importantly to the United States, which we just reached a quarter of a million deaths. Yet, over 50% of the the people in the United States, over 330 million of, of those over 50% believe it's a hoax. Now, the same thing I think, Paul, that maybe you would agree we're, we're, we're struggling with on yachts is that we don't seem to see a sincere interest universally throughout all the yachts to the risks associated with cyber uh, penetrations and risks. Yes, absolutely. Um, I guess having done this for more than 20 years now, it, it becomes quite apparent that it's quite a complex subject if you're not overly technical. Uh, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but technology moves, technology changes, it becomes part of our everyday lives. So we stop seeing it as technology. It's just a way of moving around uh, the globe. We, we're always connected. Um, and that's where it becomes quite, um, quite challenging, certainly for, for uh, cyber risk management. Um, I guess in the context of the yacht, though, we're looking at the critical safety issues. And that's where we're trying to uh, 
focus on really, isn't it? Um, so it, it, it's quite difficult in as far as for yachting, you've got uh, the generics of cyber cyber security and the term cyber security funded around in all the media uh, covering from banking to your emails. Yet we're trying to implement cyber risk management to mi mitigate uh, the risk, but increase the safety. And that's where it gets really complicated, I guess, for yacht crew, captains, management companies. So essentially what you're suggesting, what I think is what we've talked about before is that cyber risk management is not having a good cybersecurity system in place necessarily. No, cyber risk management, um, for example, if you go and look at how this has come about in the yachting industry, it, it first came around with the BIMCO and others guidelines. There was a, a document that's out there. I think we're up to version three at the moment. And that spells out quite nicely uh, the structures, the steps, the processes, the elements you would consider. And key to this is one thing, it's about safety management. Therefore, it, it's very procedural. It's very process orientated uh, in order that once you've got your house in order, your technology in order, can you operate day to day with people using it correctly? And I stress that because for more than 10 years now, the statistics as an academic always show that around about 80% of all data breaches are caused by people. And what I mean by that is it's clicking that link, it's inserting that USB, it's connecting to a network that you shouldn't have with your Wi-Fi, uh, swapping devices, sharing passwords, uh, going on social media and not being aware. Uh, so it's all those sorts of risks that come in. So that's so cyber risk management looks at the bigger picture, the bigger process, not just have I got the right technology? Do I have antivirus? Yes, they're all absolutely important, but it's a little bit more than that. Yeah. So, so do you think the market's burying its head in the sand at the moment, Mike? In general, yes. I mean, I mean, certainly some of our customers are very much aware of it. I think the larger customers and the more sophisticated users definitely understand the risks associated with a data breach. Just use that as a simple term. Uh, but I do get calls and calls from captains saying, I have this requirement that I have to meet. How can we do it quickly and for the least amount of money? Well, that's not taking it very seriously. Yeah. Uh, and so I have a concern. I, and that's why I think I started out and I said, we really need to educate our customers. And I, not against, I'm not, not necessarily for a lot of legislation or regulation, but we probably need it because in the, as Paul knows, in the banking industry, the financial industry and the health industry, they're highly required regulations on cybersecurity because of the huge concerns over personal data being released. We have the same issue on yachts, yet we're not approaching it, I think, at the same level. Thus, these captains are, that are really not taking it as seriously as I believe they should be, need to be educated. And maybe part of that education is establishing much stronger uh, rules on how to implement this protection. Mm. So, so let's put it into, into context. An ISM approved or ISM uh, managed yacht, uh, how would they approach this process now? What, what, if, if you say, okay, it's going to take, does it take a month, three months, six months, or to, to put a cyber risk management system and a robust cyber uh, security system in place, is there a timeline that is identifiable? And then is there a process you, to start the, uh, the journey? You're looking at me, Martin? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Mike. I said that, Mike. Sorry, Mike. All right. Yes. Well, I, you know, it, 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 the complexity is based upon the yacht and where yes. their, their starting point is, of course. And I think the, the first one is identify their data, their systems, and then also try to look at uh, how we can breach it. And that's really the risk management is where are the gaping holes exist in the shields around the yacht itself, if there are any shields at, at any point in time. Is there a timeline to do that? Well, I think, yes, immediately, they should be. We should do a, a penetration test to see how vulnerable they are, and then look at their, their systems and try to identify a plan 
to tighten those up and to provide the shields that we talked about. Uh, again, each of the yachts are very different, but there is a commonality. They all have data. They all have uh, crew that are carrying in USB sticks, as Paul mentioned. We have uh, vendors, uh, whether they're engine manufacturers or service engineers that are coming on board installing software within that sphere of the yacht itself. Those need to be identified and locked down. Uh, then we have the, the owners and the guests that are coming on board with their personal data, their business data on their personal devices yeah. and how best to protect them. Where, you know, in some cases, owners do not want to enter in a password. And how do we address that? So there's a lot of very, very unique issues associated with the yacht where they are not necessarily associated with, let's say, the banking or the health industry where you can dictate, no, you have to enter in a password when you bring your own device into the, uh, the platform that exists within the network. Uh, so you asked me about a time frame. I'm varying on that. I, I think you immediately have to do a risk management with a penetration to find out what you are dealing with and then analyze the equipment, the appliances, the software that's on board and the data and what type of risk data is associated with it. Mm. Well, how would you approach it? Um, we take a slightly different stance to this um, in as far as we're addressing the regulation because that's what, that's what we've been approached to do. That's what we've been requested to do. It's I've got this ISM regulation coming in and I've got to achieve what it is. The first thing it's not, and what you can't do, is it's not a list of, it's not a checklist. You can't just say, if I tick A, B, C, and D, I've got it. Um, as I said before, the technology is only one piece of the puzzle. If you look at the regulations, it says effective cyber risk management um, will have things like um, a comprehensive assessment. It will look at some sort of gap analysis. It will look at the processes and procedures around that because as much as we can put in the most robust technical solutions, one, it becomes an issue as Mike has, has rightfully identified, usability. Yeah. So straight away, we have to be able to use it. So unlike banking, we can't impose strict controls that virtually limit the use and access to a system. It's therefore, it's a leisure industry. It's, it's, it's there to be used. It's there to be enjoyed technology equally it's got the working element of it now yachting has an another tier to this and that is it's, it's one of the only environments in such close proximity are you ever going to find what the what they describe in the regulations if you read around it operational technology and informational technology uh, and i'll just quickly uh, explain what the two are the op IT, we all know what IT is. It's, it's a standard technology that we use for our data systems. The operational technology are critical systems. So for example, navigation, propulsion, engine management, uh, fire safety, door security. Now these all seem to operate quite commonly on the same technology, uh, same infrastructure. They will have access to the outside world for updates, um, backups, etc. So cyber risk management says i want to control the security because it's about security and safety and that's what the regulations are stressing so the way we tackle it is we'll do an assessment but that will cover both technical it will cover the processes and any procedures it whether they're present or not we will evaluate even working practices it doesn't have to be formally documented but we'll look at working practices we'll look at access to We'll look at how the technology is being used. From that, we can establish the requirements of this gap analysis, which is stressed in the ISM regulations. So we now know how you'd like to use it, how you are using it, and can we secure? That may very well be you need better technical solutions, or it may very well be you just need some clearer processes and some clearer guidance, but it's the combination of that. So the way we deliver it is we do a... Um, cyber risk assessment as as stipulated in the uh, guidance we will then look at the gap analysis across all of it we will then come up with a cyber risk management plan which is the requirement under the ism to have now a cyber risk management plan i will stress here again 
isn't a checklist. It's not if I do A, B, C and D in month one, I'm done. It's to evolve. It's to try and, because technology changes, it will change over time. So these are the tools that we would use to try and manage that for you. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. One of the one of the things that always concerns me on the on the yacht based sort of uh, security element is is the high turnover of personnel that adds another level of complexity to this problem, doesn't it? Well, one of the key features in uh, the ISM requirements said that all all staff it, it refers to them as staff, but it's whether it's crew, shoreside management, external contractors, all staff should have a level of preparedness and awareness uh, of cyber risks. Hence, uh, for example, we run a, a GCHQ accredited awareness training for all crew to make them aware of the key issues, which is why I'm talking about, again, the key issues around how we use technology, because it has to be usable. Uh, whereas the technologists will say, let's lock it down. You can't have access. You can't get any stronger passwords. But there's a balance, isn't it? And that's what cyber risk management is about, striking the balance between usability and security to minimize the risk to what could go wrong so that's what uh, yeah yeah so mike in your experience you i know you and i've talked about it before in terms of the the ease of uh, access to a yacht from the shore with a mobile phone you've done demos with my team and stuff in the past or talked about in the past um have we got more complex systems on board that are easier to breach or are the systems getting better anyway to be more robust? Well, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> and let me, let, me, let, me, <laughs> let me address that. First of all, yes, we're, we're putting much more sophisticated systems on board yachts. So there's no question about that. From two, two aspects. One is the actual uh, individual operational systems that Paul mentioned, such as the security systems, the navigation systems, etc. And those systems hopefully have better locks within them, but they're all operating uh, maybe on different uh, VLANs, but they're still operating on the same network, shall we say. And then as far as exposure to the outside, I, I think the more sophisticated systems we put, the more sophisticated the ability to hack into the yacht. And that is just, it's kind of like, and I'm again another analogy. Apologize for that, but it's like uh, on a treadmill. You're 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 on a treadmill, but somebody's got the the speed control, and they keep increasing it on you, and you're running faster and faster and faster. And it's like the cyber attacks; they are getting much more sophisticated. They're using they have been for quite some time using heavy AI, in which case that AI is. Uh, growing at an exponential rate by the speed of the processor and the software. So our systems have to be able to be one step ahead of it, shall we say, in the sophistication and to be able to thwart the attacks and to isolate those attacks. So that's why I said yes, it's on both sides. Yeah. So the next question I have is, is related to the, the, actually the experience you may have with yacht-based attacks. How many are you aware of? What, what are the current sort of attacks we've seen or experienced? And, and what are the implications of those attacks? Mike, you go first. Okay. Oh, well, that's, that's a big question to be very honest because uh, we're seeing attacks you know, every minute of the day on these yachts. And some of them are somewhat benign. Some of them are sophisticated. And we kind of look at a three level screening process. The first level filters out the gross attacks and then the next screen filters out the next level and the third level is the more critical ones that are able to penetrate through and then end up in a quarantine box, let's say, that requires a human to, to approach. So yes, the attacks are occurring, well, I'll say hourly, daily. There's no question about that depending upon the size of the yacht and the sophistication of the yacht and the desire for someone to hack into that level of a yacht. Um, so uh, yes, we're seeing a lot of that. And we're also seeing not only, I mean, we have different aspects and Paul probably would, would agree with this, but we have, you know, the internet, which yeah. today isn't as super fast as it's about to be over the next 18 months. That is one source. Then we have the people, the people just, carrying in devices that are 
bringing in malware that is going to affect the app. And we have people that are bringing in devices that are being installed in the network beyond the USBs. And those all have to be part of the shield process. You know, things are going to get through the first level of shields, but you have to have a second and a third and maybe a fourth level to keep screening down till you get to the worst attacks. And then it's, it's like a uh, amoeba, it's continually growing and, and regenerating itself. So as a hole is penetrated, you want that hole to be repaired. And so the same type of attack never occurs again. Mm. Oh, what's your experience recently? Um, unfortunately, I mean, uh, my background is digital forensics. So for the last 20 years, I've worked in the digital forensics industry. And it's unfortunate that I have to respond to attacks based on that when it's gone wrong. So my remit is to investigate, to examine, to establish how things have broken down, how penetrations have got in, how technologies have been exploited. And in the main, when it actually goes wrong and it becomes uh, a critical breach, whether it's theft of data, whether it's financial, my experience is it's heavily dominated by people. And people, when I say people, I mean people responding to technology, whether they are being uh, socially engineered by an email pretending to be from the captain and clicking a link to allow the technology through to be exploited, uh, or whether they put their passwords into a fake, what appears to be uh, a, an update your password. So we see an awful lot of that, unfortunately. Um, so it's the, yes, you've got the technology element in the background protecting it seamlessly or invisibly where it, it, it's doing it automatically as the attacks are coming in. But the bit that seems to break down is when people come into play. If they don't understand, they're not aware of the issues that uh, they are faced with, how to respond to it, etc. Hence, the way the uh, the IMO regulation looks at it um, for the ISM code is it looks at it under several steps, doesn't it? It, it comes up with the, the five steps of identify, uh, protect, detect, respond, and recover. So it's got different stages of what what you you are required to do. So identify where your risks are protect against them. So you've got both the technical and you've got the people-based protection. So your policies and procedures, your detection that Mike's just been talking about, about technology trying to detect, but equally people trying to cover their own um, technology use and protect their, but more importantly, what happens if it goes wrong? If it goes wrong and I'm out at sea, uh, my navigation system's gone down because I plugged the USB stick in that I shouldn't have done. How do I recover from that? What do I do to make this, the yacht safe? And that's part of the process. And that's what the ISM is getting at, safety management. And it's much broader than simply saying cybersecurity, unfortunately. So it's managing the risk and managing the implication of an attack is the ISM requirement. But going back to Mike's point, the, the, the protocols on board are part of that step change. We have to make sure that the whole yacht and the whole personnel are much more tuned into this sort of risk factor. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. It's both technical and procedural driven, and that's why the ISM has gone for this term cyber risk management. Yeah. Um, because, as I say, what happens if the navigation system? Because what you've got to remember is cyber risk isn't the same as saying uh, data breach or cyber security, because what it says is it's not necessarily about a malicious attack. It's about the negligent use of technology. So I've accidentally pressed that key that says delete and I've deleted everything or I've wiped the drive out or I've unplugged something and I've realized, oh, I shouldn't have done that. So it's not just about the malicious, the people trying, the intent to try and get into your system to deliberately break it but it's also the negligence or accidental use of it that is wrong so that's why it's cyber risk management as just opposed to uh, the threat from external actors so under this imo so let's say guidance let's say um call it guidance at the moment what are the implications if you do not meet the requirements by your verification deadline do we know yet or 
what are the well, consequences? The assumption is if it's part of the uh, the ISM requirements, then you need to uh, comply with it in order to uh, fulfill your ISM certification. Yeah. Um, so that's our understanding at the moment. Okay. I was aware there was a paper due to go back to the um, the IMO com uh, committee last May, but I haven't seen anything further subject to uh, obviously lockdown. Yeah. And that was to try and stop this issue of softly introducing it. And it was to formally say, these are the guidelines. They are very clear. They do exist. They spell it out for you how to do it. I realize they're very technical and a little bit complicated. Hence, there is some some guidance to suggest you may wish to consult with uh, professionals in that field, unfortunately. But my view is this, the first year you do it, it's going to be quite a challenge because there'll be lots of things that you haven't thought about or will be identified as a threat or a vulnerability. But by year two, you should be starting with a cyber risk management plan that says, right, over the next 12 months, we are going to train more crew. We are going to update some of our technology. We are going to manage it on a day-to-day -day basis a little bit better. And you will plan to do that. So as you start to evolve with this process, so it's not a fix on day one, tick in the box and walk away from it. It says it, it's, it's an evolving thing. It's, it's going to be forever moving as technology moves, you will move with it. Yeah, I think my is the point is it's a continual process because obviously the yacht's life cycle is continually changing as well in terms of where you're going with the yacht may have different, uh, let's say security risk in different parts of the world. Uh, Caribbean Wi-Fi networks may be different to a Monaco Wi-Fi network and vice versa. The same going to shipyards around the world. When you're going to a shipyard for a refit, things can suddenly become more relaxed or, or have different levels of security. So it, it is, as Paul says, a continual process of maintenance, monitoring and upgrading almost. So um, is the market able to service this requirement? <laughs> I, I would say probably not. Yeah. Look at the size of the fleet, who this applies to, and the deadline that's looming. Um, are, there, are there enough people like yourselves that can help the market do this properly? I, I would say no. Okay. I mean, from a, yeah, there isn't, a, there, there isn't the volume, is there? I, I'd agree with you there, Mike. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the way we've tackled this is we've come up with a framework to do it. Uh, we've had to try and break down all of the guidance, all of the regulations and put it into a structure that we can tackle it uh, and tackle the full process. Uh, hence, we're doing several at the moment. Uh, and as Mike will agree, not one will be the same. Uh, it may have been, you may have two yachts come out the same shipyard built around the same time, but they are completely different. Their technology, their processes, uh, the way it's been implemented, their records, their updates since their uh, last uh, being um, refit might be different. So we're finding all these challenges. So yes, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, interesting. All right, we've got a couple of minutes left. I'm going to ask you to, to sort of, let's say, give some uh, candid advice, all right? Listen, we've got a deadline looming. We've got a, we've got a new year deadline, the 1st of January. We've got a whole year with some cases of implementing a, a cyber risk management system. If you could give the market one piece of advice, Mike, of how to start this process, apart from calling you directly, uh, what, what is it that you think they should sit down and do as a captain or a manager today to say, okay, let's start the process? Well, first thing is admitting that you have an issue. Okay. I think that's... Like Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, we, we referenced that before uh, okay. in one of our conversations. But I think it's very, very important that they realize and admit that this is a serious issue. And a serious issue then demands a serious actions. And I would then applaud them to go out and find the best professionals, not somebody who can address, address the IMO requirements, but the best professionals to help them and guide them through this initial process and to stay with them in support. I yeah. think those are key items. Yeah. Paul? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, unfortunately, the industry has been um, bombarded with uh, companies that I've never heard of before or have never been in the cyber arena and have suddenly made a switch 
um, if there's one piece of advice, I'm not saying come to micro eye, but certainly, certainly step back, uh, do some due diligence, see who you're going to work with, see what their experience is in uh, both the technical field and around the regulations field. And I would do it that way because, as I say, I know I won't be speaking out of term and I know everybody who will be listening to this will say, I know exactly what you mean. There are lots of companies that have suddenly appeared that are suddenly wanting to get involved in cybersecurity and they've made it into something in my mind, some of it that it's just not. Uh, and for me, it should be a manageable process that gives benefit to the minimizing the risk on board. It's not about revenue streams for external companies. It's about onboard safety. Uh, and that's what I would focus on doing it. Not trying to do everything, trying to stage it because that's what the, uh, that's what the IMO is about. It's about evolving over time, getting much more secure, getting things a lot more ingrained, embedded, better technology, better processes, better practices. And that will then lead to safer onboard environments. Mike, if I could just add a little bit to that, uh, I agree with everything that Paul is saying. And I don't think either one of us want to talk down a new startup company that comes into our industry that hangs out their shingle and says cybersecurity. There are some very smart people out there, and we've got to you know, admit to that. But our industry, like a healthcare industry or banking, they're all very unique. And people that have been in the yachting industry, have been in the technology and understand the cybersecurity are probably better suited to address these initial requirements and to assist. And I think very importantly, who's going to be around to be able to assist long term with their continually growing requirements? Because as Paul pointed out, technology is growing at a very fast rate. And whatever we implement today has to be flexible enough to continue on and address the new technologies that are implemented on these yachts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's very true. I think the the era of piracy on yachts, um, probably about a decade or so ago, created a feeding frenzy on very overpriced hired guns. I think this is almost a similar situation. We have to be yeah. very careful and yeah. do the due diligence, as you say, Paul. Is there such a thing you need to look for when you're doing due diligence? Is there an accreditation or is a how do you do your homework? Just as a final thought. Yeah, it's quite an interesting one, really, isn't it? I mean, um, for all I've been in the industry for over 20 odd years now, I still felt it necessary. For example, uh, I wrote a training course for crew. I've been and got it accredited by GCHQ in the UK to demonstrate that we have tried to align to the key features of the IMO, uh, of the ISM requirements, of the guidance that's come out. Um, so, yes, there are accreditation out there. But equally, uh, reference, you know, I always find that a very good way. I'm always willing to give references from uh, the various management companies to the, the yachts where the captain's willing to provide a reference. I think that's always a, a good site. But yeah, yeah, there are some very smart people, some very intelligent people around this. But as Mike alluded to, this is very specialist stuff. I mean, where else do you get an environment within a matter of meters? You've got critical systems, you've got IT systems, you've got people on there for leisure, you've got crew living quarters, and this mix of technology, um, it takes a little bit of understanding how it's configured, how it's so tightly compact, where the different streams are going and what, what's relevant to what. So yes, yeah, yeah. I think, I think there's a final comment before we close the session is that yachting has become so much more high profile through social media and through the various internet sensations about who owns what, et cetera, that, maybe become an even bigger target in the future because of that because we'll soon find out who's living on board who's spending time with whom on board and which companies they own so that, again the the risk factor suddenly becomes not just the yacht and from a safety perspective but becomes this critical financial data or privacy data that becomes another big topic of uh, conversation but that's probably for another day uh mike any final word no i think uh, i think we, we just need to take this very seriously. Thank you very much indeed, guys. Really enjoyed that conversation. Thanks again to Dr. Paul Hunter and Mike Blake from Palladium. Thanks a million. Take care, guys. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Thank you.